Hello, everyone. My name is Ryan Majidimer, and I'm a program manager on the Azure Synapse Analytics team. Welcome. Today is our very first Azure Synapse Influencer Ask the Experts session. It's a very fun session. We've got some cool people lined up to talk today. Um, we're going to cover tips, tricks, updates from the Synapse product team, answer lots of your questions. Of course, that's the most exciting part of the session today. Um, first, I want to thank everybody for joining today, and I want to thank everybody for joining this Synapse Influencers program. There's an unbelievable amount of people that have joined us. I think we just passed 550 people or so from every tier of the program. I'm just blown away by how much excitement we have around uh, this program. Um, we are uh, just hit six weeks, so that's a giant number for us to hit in this amount of time. Um, as a reminder, this event is exclusive to Synapse Influencers. So if for some reason you are not an influencer and you made it past our very scary bouncers, then I would, of course, tell you to just go run right away and join the Influencers program. It's really easy. I'm sure most of the people here are familiar with the, uh, the website. Super easy to sign up. Just a couple clicks. Um, Moving right along um, as a bit of housekeeping here. So um, for the Q&A, you want to submit all of your questions right into the Teams live event. We'll be able to answer all of those questions. Some of the questions we'll answer live. Some of the answers we will do uh, right into the chat there. Um, we're going to try to focus all of our question answers that are live on data integration, which is the theme today. Um, so if there's any questions that are maybe a little bit less data integration E. We may push those on to the next uh, session or answer those offline. Um, let's see, where are we at here? Um, and again, so these sessions are gonna be every two weeks. So if you have a non data integration question or we don't get to one of your questions, um, definitely join the next event. We uh, will be covering all sorts of things, ML, Spark, uh, SQL, of course. Um, and it's very exciting. So um, with that all said, I'm very pleased to introduce our experts for today. We've got Mark Cromer and Suna Sabat from the data integration team today. Um, and they're gonna be chatting, of course, about data integration. Uh, we also have several chat moderators as well. So they'll be hiding in the shadows, helping answer questions and uh, bring questions our, to our attention to answer live. So let's kick off the Q&A with an easy question. So Mark, what's something really exciting about, or really exciting that our community can do with Azure? With Azure, nice. Um, yeah, thanks Ryan, um, love it. So uh, what I would say, a couple of things to that effect. And first of all, let me uh, kind of mirror what um, uh, Ryan was saying. And thank you so much everybody for joining the program and for joining today. Um, but you know, I've in you know I've been in the Azure team uh, working on this on, on data analytics for uh, what is it now seven years. Uh, been at Microsoft for over twelve, and um, uh, what what an exciting, just unbelievable time to be in this sort of cloud data analytics space, and uh, the great opportunity to be able to talk to everybody today. Love the opportunity. Um, but some of the exciting things that you can do, and you think about you know our topic today, which is specifically Azure Synapse Analytics and data integration. Um, uh, some of the exciting things that I see um, that I'm excited by what I see customers do is really essentially transform their business. Yeah, and that that sounds very, you know, lofty, right? Um, and not really grounded, but it really is. And and the reason for it is because the, the idea of what we sort of call as a digital transformation, which has been going on for a number of years now in, in many businesses, is this idea of taking the way that you've uh, done business and the way that you have um, provided analytics for your business and, and data-driven decision-making, and we've transformed that by uh, providing cloud platform services uh, like Synapse uh, to give you a way to be able to scale quickly, to be able to quickly build really powerful um, applications based on data, and to be able to do that in a way that doesn't require you to, um, you know, to essentially you know the the old style of acquiring lots of um, uh, lots of infrastructure and having to have to build that out over long periods of time is to be able to accelerate your time to market 
Um, so if I put that more into very specific use cases that I see, I see a lot of big data analytics. I see a lot of, you know, again, I'm on the data integration side, right? So I'm a little biased to this, but I see a lot of moving large amounts, terabytes, petabytes of data into the Azure data lake. Um, using Synapse Analytics as a way to do that, using the pipelines and the data flows that are in Azure Synapse Analytics to do that. And then be able to provide analytics on top of that based on um, uh, the capabilities that are right there inside of the analytics Synapse workspace or Synapse Analytics workspace, which is Spark and the SQL pools and whatnot. And it's that, that combination of all of that capability in a single pane of glass that is the game changer that is um, Azure Synapse that we've been working on for a number of years now. <clears throat> so let me back up for one second because I just realized I said a lot and uh, <laughs> I want to just kind of uh, level set a couple of things as we go throughout this, uh, This I think we have an hour, so as we go throughout this hour. Number one is that, um, um, so by the way, I'm Mark here, but in case you didn't catch Ryan uh, in terms of what my name is, and uh, I'm a program manager on the Azure Data Factory team. Data Factory is the powered, is the engine that powers uh, Synapse pipelines and data flows. Um, and so we include all that we've done um, on that space and ETL inside of Azure Synapse Analytics. Um, and so we're responsible for that part of the platform. And so anytime that you need to ingest data uh, at scale and you need to transform data in a low code environment, you want to build uh, and design pipelines uh, to build and manage those capabilities. That's all powered by Data Factory, and that's what we, we provide inside of Azure Synapse. And, and the value prop, as I stated earlier, is that the ability to have all of that into a uh, single pane of glass, um, and you spin up a workspace, and you get all this capability that's baked in there without needing to manually tie things together, um, you know, one by one. And that's, uh, that's the real power of Azure Synapse Analytics. So, Ryan, I think I went really sideways on the answer on that one, but there's just so much to talk about, and I just kind of wanted to uh, level set some of that. And what I'm really excited about today is to kind of hear some of the other questions, as well as uh, I think if we have an open chat, if it's I know it may not be, a, um, uh, be able to speak, but definitely, you know, not just give us your questions, give us, you know, sort of some input in terms of how you're using um, Synapse and how you'd like to see uh, Synapse to be used to solve these, uh, these analytics uh, use cases that you have. Uh, so Sunil is on now too, and so both he and I represent uh, Data Factory. And you know, this, we don't necessarily say that we are um, Azure Synapse Pipelines uh, PMs because it's kind of all one and the same. Um, users will see when you're using Synapse Analytics, you will see some slight differences between ADF and um, Synapse Pipelines. I just kind of want to let me let me draw some of those things for you uh, here in terms of what to think about when you see differences and what that really means. The um, the reason why there's some differences is, is, is a couple of reasons. Um, one is um, Synapse Analytics is meant to be a single place that you can design and build very easily and quickly big data analytics uh, solutions in the cloud. But ADF is really meant to be more agnostic than that. It's, it's meant to allow you to bring in data from anywhere and land it almost pretty much anywhere. You can do that with Synapse Analytics pipelines, but the different orientation is that it's really primarily, uh, not primarily, but it's really laser focused on getting your data into that workspace, right? Getting the data into your lake in that workspace, getting it into the um, the SQL pools so do, that you can run notebooks on it, you can run queries on it. So it's a slightly different oriented kind of um, value prop, which is why you'll you see some differences in there. We have, you know, initially when we went to market, we didn't have SSIS in there. We have that in there now. Um, so these things are starting to come on online. Um, and a common thing that you're not going to see is things like you can't do cross-region integration runtimes. I'm getting into some detail now if you haven't used, if you're not all that familiar with um, Synapse, um, I apologize if I'm using terms you don't know really well. I can always step back throughout the hour and kind of discuss these things in more detail. But if you're familiar with ADF and Synapse, you will see that integration runtimes cannot go across regions in Synapse, which is another difference. And the reason for that is because the workspace is essentially tied to a region, whereas in Data Factory, the factors are not tied to a region. The, the metadata is a little bit looser in terms of the way that's built. But think about Synapse as such a much greater value that you get the data factory that it makes sense that these things are a little bit more tied to keeping your data locality a lot more tied to a region than with data factory because data factory we can't make assumptions about where your data is it can be anywhere with synapse analytics you're building that lake in that uh sql pool in a specific region 
so things like that will come up and we can talk about those throughout the hour. But I just kind of want to expand on that, uh, Ryan, just a little bit, because I think it's a good question to ask. So to follow up on that, um, sort of two part question. One, uh, and you mentioned that the regions already in a couple other points, but is there full feature parity between ADF and Synapse? And then also, is there a difference in cost between the two? Yeah. No, great questions. Uh, no difference in cost. Um, costs are the same, and we intentionally did that. Um, and then um, other other sort of features. So when we launch a new feature in ADF, um, the intent is to always have that flow directly into Synapse. There's no reason to uh, not have that happen. There may be occasionally some things that we don't want to for reasons that could be, you know, perhaps there's a, a difference in the way that we want to surface that feature in Synapse versus ADF. A good example of this actually just came to my, came to my mind is a good example is the Power Query activity in um, ADF. We have not surfaced that in uh, Synapse. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One is because we have a different way that we handle VNets in Synapse versus in ADF. Um, and Power Query and the Power BI infrastructure that has uh, VNet enabled is a slightly different um, implementation than what we have in Synapse. And so we're working toward having that capability uh, land in the next, you know, I'd say six to 12 months uh, within Synapse. But today you're, you're not gonna see that um, uh, that feature there in Synapse, but that was intentional because of that uh, networking difference between the two um, the two uh, services. But, you know, like everything else that is on the roadmap, like I said, to be able to uh, to make that happen. Um, otherwise, like for example, we, we just launched um, user-defined functions I think some of these were on your uh, uh, the updates that you put out, Ryan. Uh, we had user defined functions. We have the assert arrow handling that's coming out. All that stuff will just flow directly um, into Synapse as well. There are different. Uh, this is a little bit of an implementation detail for you all, but there are different sort of deployment trains that we have as things kind of make their way into public regions. So you may see if you see a blog come out from Ryan or me or Sunil or anybody else. It, it may be that we see it in EDF today, but you don't see it yet in Synapse, and that could just be a delay in terms of the deployment on that. Um, but that's usually just a matter of days or weeks until those things light up. Yeah. And also, you know, uh, another point I would like to point out is uh, the way you do CI CD in EDF and the way you do CI CD in yeah. Synapse pipeline. That's the difference uh, because uh, because the EDF uh, CI CD came a little earlier. It, 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 this came with Azure DevOps integration, you know, with some Python backend, but you know, Synapse pipeline is new, you know, new, right? So it is built on JavaScript with GitHub actions, okay? So there is a little difference there, but uh, the end also, you know, for everybody, right? Uh, Synapse uh, pipeline, uh, Synapse, everything starts from workspace, right? Workspace is your home, pipeline plan is part of it, right? But in the ADF, it's 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 by its own, right? So you can see that kind of you know, um, you know, uh, uh, corollary, you know, just to see you know what could be different. Okay, yeah. Well, it's an important point that Sino's making because I want you know kind of keep that in mind is that the CI/CD within Synapse is much more complicated than ADF because you have so many different artifact types to worry about, um, from your SQL scripts to your notebooks. To things like that. So, um, uh, the you know is absolutely right. The features that we do in ADF CI/CD are different than what you see in Synapse CI/CD. So, when you have requirements that you'd like to see and you put those into user voice um, publicly online, uh, and by the way, please do so. We we read those all the time. By the way, um, love that. Um, just specify whether or not you need that in Synapse or ADF because they are different uh, code paths. And and just to, to agree to agree with Mark, right? For example, for ADF, right, the auto publish in CI CD is a very popular feature. It came eight months back to ADF, but now it is available in Synapse pipeline also. Okay, okay. Just just I'm just adding, right? We were catching up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's fantastic. Um, so here's for the next question. So uh, this actually uh, somewhat relates to uh, part of the middle uh, of your answer there, uh, Mark. But uh, um, so this question is: In secure environments, runtimes are needed to connect securely via private endpoints. Are there any plans to simplify this process in the future? Yeah, it is a little. Um, it can be a little hairy. It can be a little intimidating uh, sometimes. And we totally recognize that and um, totally agree with that feedback. Um, yes, we have plans to make that simpler. Uh, and I'll tell you one thing is that um, uh, what's really interesting to me is that um, a lot of ways that customers over the years, not just in Synapse, but also in ADF, has have kind of um, 
been able to connect into private endpoints uh, is to use the self-hosted integration runtime to do that. Uh, we actually these days now prefer uh, that you look at using the um, Azure integration runtime with the uh, private endpoint capability in it. So essentially manage VNet uh, within the Azure integration runtime. And uh, we have documentation online uh, so you can you can search this up on our uh, docs is how to set up the um, private endpoints with managed VNet. It's it, the series of steps are laid out in there, and I totally get it that if you're not comfortable with networking, you could be like just completely thrown off by it. So we have plans to make that um, simpler and essentially kind of like, like a almost like a package that you could just deploy to make that happen. Um, that's something that we have in the plans that's on the roadmap. Um, but I'd, I'd love to see us be able to uh, to land at some time in the near future. Um, for now, follow the directions. If you get stuck in anything, um, you can make a ticket on it, and then we get engineers to uh, support engineers to help you through that. But I, I'd like you to consider using the managed VNet um, as a way to uh, to connect into those private endpoints going forward. Awesome. Um, cool. And, and so uh, to change the topic a little bit to uh, like roadmap and the future of uh, of Azure and ADF and Synapse. Um, can you tell us about what the the future of ADF is? So, in the the long term, do we see ADF fading away with Synapse and ADF coming into full parity, or um, what's the story around that? Ah, uh, Brian, you set me up perfect. Okay, I'm going to share something here. <laughs> so let me share my screen. Give me one sec so I can get the right screen up. And then I will share this with you. So if I go to my teams and I say share and screen. OK, I'm going to move Ryan off my screen. There you go. OK, so I want to share with you a couple of things. It's a great question. And um, let me tell you a little bit about uh, I'm going to actually be able to go into presentation mode on this one. OK, so. Assuming you can all see my screen, um, I want to level set a couple of things. So this is this is a great way to talk about. Um, I would say, as opposed to ADF versus Synapse Analytics, the way to think about things within data integration on Microsoft is as a single product portfolio for data integration. Um, and uh, there's actually multiple sort of products that make up this space within Microsoft. And this is the taxonomy. Um, and what's really interesting within Microsoft is that we recently reordered the product team so that. Everything you see on the screen is underneath one group now. Um, it's very important for us to do this so that when we get questions like this one, that you can sort of understand how we we see the um, the future of data integration within Microsoft. So if you start at the top left, you have Data Factory and SSIS. And SSIS of all of these products has been in the market the longest, right? It's been in the market for decades, and it was um, it's essentially the on-prem uh, data integration ETL tool from Microsoft. It's been with SQL Server for a long, long time. Um, and then in the data factory team, what we've done over the years is we've made that into a um, uh, a cloud enabled service as well um, that you can spin up integration runtimes that are SSIS integration runtime. So that's the top left. I'm going to go bottom next because this is really what we're focused today, which is Azure Synapse that has the pipelines and the data flows from data factory embedded inside of it. Now go to the top right where you see Power Query. So Power Query had traditionally been in the um, uh, Power BI and the Office uh, product line, and we've brought that into data integration within uh, Microsoft. So I was mentioning earlier the Power Query activity that's in ADF. That was our first kind of effort to sort of bring these technologies together into a single place, and um, and we've done that in ADF, and, and we'll make some efforts to do this in Synapse as well. Uh, some really exciting things that we're going to do there. If you look at the entire sort of um, taxonomy here, you'll see that um, all these things are uh, provide a rich set of ETL and data integration capabilities, data integration um, and ingestion capabilities, all the way from you know Excel scale to petabyte scale. Um, now, the challenge that we have is how do we make this possible for you all to be able to do these things without needing to know which one to do? Right? You don't want to have to like have this this uh, this menu and say okay or this decision tree. I'm going to do A, B, C. So I use product. D, right? The the idea here is that we can make this all uh, easy for you. And Synapse is, is our way to kind of, you know, bring these things together so you don't have to think about that. Um, we know that we have, you know, some more work to do um, in that area, and we're going to be doing some more things in that area to kind of make that 
a little bit a little bit easier. But the fact that matters is that Data Factory is a standalone um, ETL service within Azure, and it's the go-to um, one there. In fact, if you look at things like the Gartner Magic Quadrant, when they examine data integration cloud tools, you'll see that um, you know, Data Factory is the key product there that puts us in the leader quadrant, and, and that's that's what's for. So if you're essentially building a um, uh, an analytics uh, service within your company, uh, if that's your job, you'll probably use Data Factory for that. If you're going to build a, um, a full solution based on uh, Synapse, and that's going to be in Azure, and that's going to have um, these Synapse Spark, and you're going to be landing the data into SQL pools and into the lake, um, I would definitely recommend that you just look at just standing up a Synapse workspace to do that. You get Data Factory built in. You don't have to stand, stand up a separate Data Factory instance. It's very helpful in that regard. Um, now, I know that we can make this cleaner, and we're definitely working toward that. I just wanted to see if maybe this kind of helps clarify some of those things. You can see the different, you know, um, paths of Data Factory as an ETL service, Synapse as a data analytics service that has ETL built into it. The, the thinking was that um, even if we give you, you know, um, Synapse Analytics, both Data Factory as a separate tool, you still have to kind of wire things together on your own. Um, but with Synapse, now you don't have to do that. You, you don't have to stand up a separate ETL service. Um, so that's the thinking behind the separation of those two. Well, speaking of simplification, um, of course, uh, pipelines and Synapse and ADF in general are very uh, um, low code, no code. Uh, there's a lot of that in there. Um, but the question is, uh, are there any plans to simplify the creation process of pipelines um, more so than just templates to reduce your startup times? And by startup times, you mean essentially the, the startup time uh, to build a, a new project, or exactly, yeah, yeah, to get up and running in a in a new project. Yeah, I'll tell you what. I'll, I'll jump on this one first, and I'll let Sunil kind of have a few uh, comments on it too. I'm sure he's got some interesting thoughts on here. Sunil works really closely a lot with a lot of our customer implementations, and can probably answer give me maybe give a few generic, generalized um, uh, perspectives on it. But what I would say first of all is just that yeah, so templates is a great way to get started. Let me actually share again real quick. Um, Sorry, Snow, just give me a just give me a minute. I get all excited about this stuff. Um, Come on, go ahead. <laughs> uh, so what I wanted to share real quick is um not this one, but over here inside of Synapse. Uh, if you haven't seen this yet, if you go to the home page within Synapse, there is this idea called the Knowledge Center. Um and so in here is a whole bunch of just ridiculous amounts of samples um and galleries. Um and there are pipeline examples in here, not just examples for um, for Synapse, Spark, and SQL. There's also a whole ability to have pipelines that you can start with um, in here. Um, so I, I think Ryan's question was kind of saying besides templates, but I just want to reemphasize that templates is a great way to get started. And I, and I really um, encourage you to take a look at the gallery that we have. We put a lot of effort into it, and I think that you'll find a lot of value um, in that. But yeah, the, the idea behind these pipelines is that you know you can essentially either start from a template or start from scratch on the integrate section of a synapse and just go ahead and start building a pipeline and when you do you're going to have the canvas with all these rich set of activities that you can build that you can put together now you may kind of sometimes be overwhelmed by this if you haven't used adf before because it, it's kind of opens a question for anyone new to this saying where do i get started how do i even start with this right um so we have a lot of tutorials online and the documentation that you can use to get started. We have a lot of videos. We have a YouTube channel. I'll tell you what I'll do is after I'm done sharing, well, uh, Sunil's uh, kind of giving you some other ways to kind of get started. Yeah. I'll, I'll put a few links in the chat. Exactly. Uh, actually, can I share that? I don't know if I can share in the chat on here, but I'll figure it out. And I'll, I'll give you some some uh, examples. We have a whole YouTube channel that gives you some tutorials on how to get started and still you want to say a few words go for it yeah yeah so uh, uh, i'd like to you know th th uh, again this is to add on to what mark said right i want to share something here for everybody to watch right so as you know like both just like adf right we have a full uh, rest interface uh, for synapse pipeline right here if you look at this is the doc right you know you can you can create a pipeline run you know everything you can do with sdk right you know and uh, that's in an easy way you know to actually you know trigger your run your pipeline get the status of the pipelines right you know and and then etc right you know 
So I just wanted to, you know, uh, because nowadays, you know, everything goes by, you know, API calls, right? You know, and it's so, so that, you know, if you want to say, within ADF, right? Uh, I'm just giving an example, right? You want to, uh, you know, uh, run the Sinas pipeline and get the status or do other way around, right? For ADF pipeline, you can do all with REST SDK. Okay, that's one way to look at it. Okay. Yeah, so I think, I think the takeaway from that is that, um, um, I think what you know is kind of sort of getting at there is besides the um, design interface that we have with our UI, you, we have a lot of customers that do this. They essentially automate the generation of um, pipelines through the SDK, which is a very common way to do things as well. It's not necessarily your uh, go-to-market quickly uh, solution. Um, templates are really kind of the answer for that. Um, but the tutorials, so I also gave a video link. I think um, uh, Tyler said he could share that to you all. Uh, and say alias link to all of our YouTube videos. Um, yep, yep. And on there, put any comments in the videos if there's other videos you'd like to see us do, um, and we'll definitely add to so There's over 100 videos on there now, and um, definitely add more uh, yeah. based on your request. Yeah, so, so again, right? So so here you give in fact for Synapse pipeline, you know, because this is a modern product, right? Our uh, REST interface, you know, to build to write the pipeline, you know, using a JSON, right? You can see, right, and I can do a for each. I'm doing copy within the pipeline. I'm building this whole uh, the whole pipeline, and then you know I'm going to create a run. You know, I can create and can run. Actually, I will say Sina's pipeline has a better interface, a modern interface. You know, how to quickly, you know, create it and run it. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's always always good to hear that Synapse is one upping uh, ADF. So uh, that's good news as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> um, well, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> cool. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, on to the next question. Uh, I'm not sure what this means, but uh, this I guess is from Mark, and it says, "Can the Eagles possibly win with Jalen Hurts?" <laughs> I, I don't know what this means, but uh, well, maybe that, maybe this is unrelated. Uh, can so, we answer it? Can I answer it in the DI? Uh, <laughs> yeah. um, so if you create your pipeline and then you say that, yes, of course they can. <laughs> um, okay. So. Uh, uh, back to the matter at hand here. Um, the question, and back to like roadmap questions. Um, are you planning on um, adding uh, integration for Delta Lake more into ADF uh, and Synapse pipelines more generally? Yeah, I mean, um, so Delta Lake is just ridiculously popular uh, with our customers on Data Factory and Synapse pipelines as they load data into the lake, right? I mean, it just makes it so much easier. Okay, okay. I'm going to share again. Um, so give me a sec, do this, and that's not what I wanted. I want this one, there we go. Okay, so a really important thing about um, what you will see in um, Synapse for Delta Lake is uh, I really recommend you, if you're gonna use Delta Lake with your pipelines, is to use the data flows capability within, um, uh, within Synapse. So the reason for that is because, and, and by the way, so, so pipelines is here under ingest, under, <laughs> under integrate to ingest data. Data flows, which is also coming from data factory is under develop. So it's a slightly different orientation. Again, things are, you know, a little bit a different uh, sort of context in Synapse than they are in data factory. And so if you go into the, the develop section within um, Synapse, you'll see data flows are here. Now, the reason why it works better in um, data flows than in let's say copy in a pipeline is because within data flows and synapse we're actually using the synapse spark infrastructure to execute these so it's natively built on spark and so the delta integration is much much richer here if you use copy uh, within your pipeline for Delta Lake, it's going to use Databricks um, for that. Um, so that, that's a limitation. You have to bring your uh, Databricks cluster for that to work. So I recommend you using um, data flows. Now, if you if you start to look at this, you'll see a lot of rich capabilities in here. And coincidentally, both Sunil and I are working on, in fact, I think if you look at my tabs up here, you'll see I have a, I have a GitHub open where I'm actually updating the documentation for this because we're adding some new features and we're going to I'm going to try to get to the find the time to record a video this week or next week on specifically optimizations for Delta Lake loading because 
we're getting to the point where we have so many features for Delta Lake that it, it just becomes right now it just looks like a grab bag of options within Delta Lake and it's hard to understand sometimes which ones to use when. So if I were to, for example, let me show you how to use this. I have just a source in the sink in my data flow. Source doesn't matter. This could be anything. Let me just pick something. I'll just pick like a movies database that I have. Actually, that movies database, but a movies um, file in uh, this is a blob store. On my sink, if I make my sink to be um, a Delta Lake, I would choose inline. OK, so inline means that I'm not going to use one of the shared data sets that comes with um, Synapse. The data sets are shared, uh, are listed here um, under um, integration data sets in Synapse. This is the same thing as ADF data sets, OK? But instead, what I'm going to do is in my sync, I'm going to say inline. So that means that the definition of the data set is defined directly inside of my data flow. It's inlined. There is an inline data set type, which is Delta Lake. Now, Delta is um, built on ADLS Gen 2, so I need to pick a link service for my Gen 2. Now, when I do that, you're going to see all these just um, incredible capabilities that you're going to have when you land the data into Delta Lake. Um, you can use the vacuum capability to clean up uh, essentially um, older partitions within your Delta Lake. You're going to be able to compress the parquet files based on different compression types. Um, it can act like a like a table, a database table, which is really the power of Delta Lake, right? The ability to get that sort of CRUD capability. We can truncate that table. We can overwrite the tables. Um, you can insert, upsert, update, delete. Just incredibly powerful. This is why so many of our customers are using it because performing these operations natively in a data lake without having Delta is very very difficult to do. You have to you know know how to use partitioning very extensively to be able to do that. You can set the uh, the UMask on the files that are written, and then you have the Delta options inside of that. Um, you can have the ability to um, merge the schemas. So when the schemas differ, you can merge those together. Uh, you can do auto compact. Uh, so this will essentially uh, compact the size of the parquet files. This is something you probably don't want to do on every run, but it's something that's good to do occasionally. And then optimize write is essentially setting the, the size of the files to the optimized size when you output um, those files. And so this could be something that can improve your performance as well. We're, we have some guidance on how to use these in the docs. This is the part that we're trying to make um, a little bit better. And this is actually something if I go over to my, by the way, so if I go over to my data factory, this is data factory. As you can see, they look almost exactly the same. Just the orientation of where things are located is slightly different in the two products. But if I go over to my data flow over here, and if I add a sync for um, my Delta Lake in data factory, And now I have to pick my data lake store. And then go to my settings. You see all the same things are going to be available to you um, over here as well. Um, and that is a way that you can essentially use um, Delta Lake in either tool uh, to get uh, really good use out of the uh, capabilities that are available to you in Spark to be able to write this very effectively. Um, it, it's much better than using copy um, in a pipeline uh, is to use the, uh, the data flows within Delta. So I hope that gave you some good insights or at least helped answer the question. Uh, there's a lot more detail in terms of when you would use auto compact and optimize write that we'll put some guidance out there and for that, essentially the auto compact is something that typically when you're, if you're gonna write this as a notebook, you will um, do that occasionally to um, compact those uh, parquet files, but I would not do that on every run. If you're running a, a sync in a data flow, you know, every 10 minutes, 15 minutes, you may not want to do that every time. You may just wanna do that on maybe uh, once a day or once an hour uh, kind of run. Well, speaking of Spark, here's a little bit more of a, uh... A nuanced question for people that are already using um, Spark pools or uh, using Spark in general for um, uh, Synapse or ADF, and that's uh, one of the big considerations is spin up time for Spark clusters. So, are there any ways that you can avoid having um, as much spin up time so you can you don't have to wait for your notebooks to run? So, for instance, if you have three notebooks that are going to take five minutes to run. 
you really just want to have the spin up time and then have them run for however long they're going to run instead of having to wait for a spin up for each of them. Are there any ways currently that you can avoid that or are there plans in the future to help mitigate this? So specifically for notebooks in um, Spark, I, I don't know I can speak too much specifically to it. Um, on the DI side, on the data integration side, we have capabilities that um, we do essentially TTL there so that you can um, have that cluster always available to you to run your data flows without any delay on it. Um, in fact, within Data Factory, we have now on the debug pool, the um, uh, we have uh, essentially the ability to have that cluster pooled so that every time you start up a debug cluster, in fact, I can, okay, I'm gonna share again. I love to show this stuff, it's just so cool. You know, sorry. So on the Data Factory side, I have my um, debug session running that is using um, Spark. If I stop this, and then I start it back up right away. Uh, this should start as long as the demo gods are with me today. This should start in a couple of seconds, not a couple of minutes. And that's because we're pooling those clusters. Now, on the notebook side, that's using the Spark pools within Synapse. And I, I'm not, there you go. See, that started really, really quick. That didn't take three minutes. That took like three seconds, essentially. That's all on the data integration on the pipeline in the data flow side. The notebook side, that team that is working on notebooks, I'm not. 100% sure um, if they're making that a little bit better. I'm assuming there's probably a TTL that you could use for that as well, but I can't answer that um, too specifically in terms of what the notebook team is doing to make that better. Okay. I'm sure what we're doing, but. <laughs> <laughs> no, and I, and I think the the, uh, the question was focused around uh, like pipelines, so I think that covers it pretty good. Um, to go back to, um, or actually, sorry. So uh, w during during your demos, you talked about a sync. Um, is is there a, a nuance to that terminology, or um, there's a there's a little bit of a concern about adding more and more sort of jargon to uh, Synapse and Azure in general? Um, can you talk about a little bit more about what a sync is? Yeah, sync is just where your data goes, um, and it's. Uh, um, this is a common uh, thing that we discuss internally uh, within the team is what to call that, right? Um, I, I gave you that slide earlier that showed the different uh, tools that surface to end users in terms of Microsoft Data Integration, Power Query, SSIS, Data Factory, so on and so forth. And they kind of use different terminologies um, within uh, those tools. And uh, first of all, sorry about that. <laughs> Secondly is, uh, yeah, we, we should sort of conform on that and we totally get that. Um, uh, ADF has traditionally used the word sync to, to me essentially if you're if you use Power Query and Power Query data flows, you probably know those as output destinations or at least as like a, a way to the destination for your data. SSIS would be destinations. Um, we're definitely going to do some work on around conforming on that terminology going forward. But sync is the same thing as where your data goes. Um, I think that I think on the ADF side we chose sync because it really kind of was um, ADF was born out of sort of like the big data world and the Hadoop world, and uh, typically uh, the terminology sync was used in that when you think about Kafka and other types of of, term, of technologies that land big data, we would say sync, and that's the reason why we, we chose that. But it's it's the weird thing we do in Microsoft is like to introduce a lot of different terms. Um, that's what it means. And, uh, and I'd like to uh, run out of tad here, right? So in the Synapse pipeline or in ADF, right? Everything is a transformation, right? When we have a source, we are doing a transformation, right? We are doing a Java connection and you know, Spark connection to something source, and you are pulling the data. Similarly, for sync, we are you know, using a Spark processor to you know write to that destination. So 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 this whole transform everything is a transformation, right? So sync is a transformation. That's why you, we never use destination or something. Destination cannot be a transformation, right? So that's another philosophy, you know? Yeah, yeah. Awesome. So Sunil, this is a question maybe uh, you can touch on. So um, obviously uh, Synapse is a much newer product than ADF, and ADF is uh, a much more mature product. Um, and there's, you know, we've talked a little bit about it, the differences, and um, this is another difference is um, needing to be able to share and link uh, integration runtimes. Um, so this is a feature that's part of ADF, but, you know, isn't part of Synapse. 
And the question is, is this intentional? And are there approaches that customers can take to work around this? Yes. So uh, this, uh, for example, right, so idea, you can share our shared uh, self-hosted integration runtime. You can share it, you know, among, among ADF of, uh, data factories, right? That feature is not available in Synapse, you know, yet it's because of, again, the Synapse security model, right? Synapse is a workspace centering. It is own, right? So the workspace like so, you know, for, for security and the private channel, private link service, you know, how many ports are open and, you know, what channel, what data plane, control plane. So th this works pretty well with, uh, you know, one SHIR. Now, if you take that SHIR and share with uh, different workspaces, right? You are basically opening, you have to open up everything in SHIR, right? And SHIR is designed for secure access to your on-prem data sources, right? So if you said that, right, our engineering team is working, you know, maybe by year end, right? We should be able to share SHIR, you know, uh, between, you know, uh, within Synapse, right? Given some, you know, security guidelines, okay? But you will, maybe the year end, you just hear some updates from us, okay? Yeah, yeah. Mark, you want to add something on SHIR sharing? Mark, I think you're uh, muted. <laughs> Dang, yeah, but I knew I was going to get caught sooner or later. Um, yeah, so no, I think Sunil hit it right on the head. Um, and it's absolutely right. And we, we totally recognize that it's something that uh, is a frequent ask. So uh, just keep pushing us on it. Um, it's just a matter of us uh, getting the right priority. Yep. Exactly. But, but like, like Sunil said, it's a little more complicated on the Synapse side, which is why it hasn't landed there yet. Yeah, you know, just to give you again, this is a very popular question, right? Just to solve this problem, right? Our SHR engineering team is working with Azure networking, Azure storage, you know, Azure security, Synapse versus security. We're working with like seven or eight groups now, you know, to make it work, you know? <laughs> so, yeah. Yep, it's all, it's all coming together. Yes, yes. Um, so to change gears a little bit, um, obviously there's the recent launch of uh, Power BI Data Mart. Um, so the question is, um, since Power BI Data Mart offers a low code approach to ETL, how does this fit in with Synapse? How is it different from Synapse? Um, uh, maybe I know this is a little bit out of the necessarily the ADF wheelhouse, but um, like how do how do all of these things connect together? Why would you choose when? Why or when would you choose one or the other? Yeah, interesting question. So um, there's a lot of excitement around um, data marts, um, but you know, I mean, data marts is a it's a Power BI uh, construct, right? An artifact. Um, so at the end of the day, that's that's the primary difference. Um, Synapse is meant more for building your big data analytics solution in Azure, uh, and the things within Power BI are much more geared around things like a. a you know, I, I'm glad they call it data marts because it's meant to be that sort of maybe um, uh, you know group kind of um, place to store data versus your entire organization enterprise data warehouse kind of thing that you would do. So that, that's a primary difference. The other thing is that um, you know that is essentially um, um, a, a smaller database size that you would be producing in that regard. When you're in Synapse, the um, idea is that you can be building a very large um, uh, implementation of a data warehouse and of a data lake house for that matter. You could be using lake database for that matter too, if you wanted to within Synapse. But I think that the the approach with data marts is very interesting and something that I think you're going to see something along those lines sort of um, going forward within um, the DI team. I, I showed earlier that combination of um, Synapse with EDF with Power Query, and we have that Power Query activity today in EDF, and we like to bring that forward into Synapse. And what Data Marts does is essentially, you know, takes that Power Query UI and allows you to build what they call a data flow, uh, just like Synapse's data flow. It's a very similar kind of concept, and produce um, a um, a serialized set of data at the end of that in a database, and uh, that's also very common within Synapse. So I think that the ability to have something like the Power Query UI be able to produce those things is very compelling because a lot of what we sort of think of as citizen data integrators, I'd like to do that. Um, the folks who, you know, uh, there's there's a slight difference in personas, by the way. A citizen data integrator would be someone who is more of a business analyst that is uh, working on sort of functional reports and uh, smaller database sizes versus someone in Synapse who is more of a data engineer 
um, who is going to work on uh, cross team, cross organization, enterprise data warehouse types of things. Um, the tools that we have in Synapse, even the data flows and the pipelines that we have in Synapse are sometimes a little bit too um, overwhelming or um, uh, complex for sort of citizen data integrators. So they, they like to stay within that Power Query UI. And so Data Marts did that just like we did with the Power Query activity in ADF. And so I think that uh, we're just trying to prove that that um, technology is a very compelling way for users to work with data. And so um, I think you'll probably see that kind of um, proliferate throughout the, um, the products, including Synapse at some point. I don't have any, there's no ETAs on any of that. I'm just saying that that's, <laughs> that's definitely a, that's, that's a way to go. By the way, if you're using um, Data March today, um, you know, because it's, in public, because it's in preview, please be sure to, uh, you know, uh, send feedback on that through user voice um, and social and all that. Really want to get your input on it. Yep. Uh, and also, you know, one thing I'd like to add it here is so the data mart is very Power BI specific, enabling business users write SQL to do what Ryan said transformations, right? But but you look at the ADF and the Synapse pipeline, right? Synapse pipeline, right? We have like different ways, you know, to do the same thing, right? Within Synapse pipeline, you could write a SQL script to do the transformation, right? Or like or like you know, you can uh, do you know so script activity, you know, to do some transformation, you know this. This whole ELT concept, right? Is yes, you know you can do that, you know, uh, you know, even you know, uh, you know, without having that Power BI like interface, you know. But but if if like that Power BI like interface on Synapse pipeline, able to do you know this SQL based uh, transformation, would love to you know hear some feature. Okay, yeah. Any request on that? Okay. All right. So to change gears a little bit away from. The technology. We have a question a little bit about the program itself. So, one of the questions that we had is um, about the MVP program versus the influencer program. So, for those of you who aren't aware of the Microsoft MVPs, what these people are is it's a very exclusive program of people that are um, nominated and then voted for um, to the program um, in different award categories. So, for instance, uh, the people that work uh, with um, ADF and Synapse are in the data platform uh, award category. And these are people that are experts in their field. They have typically years and years experience, very well-known people that get nominated to that program. And one of the things with that program is um, they're also encouraged to engage in the community. So they make videos, they uh, um, show up to <laughs> things like this, they uh, tweet, all sorts of stuff like that. Um, in contrast to the influencer program, where it's the bigger the better, everybody's welcome. It doesn't matter what your experience level is. Um, everybody's weren't welcome to join in on the fun, and uh, you know, it doesn't matter what your experience level is. It doesn't matter, um, at least to a large extent, how active you are. As long as you're like minimally active, you're more than welcome to join the club, get your badge, and if you want to move up to different levels, obviously we would encourage that. Some people myself included, become champions, uh, creating lots of content, being very active on social media. Um, but, you know, it's up to you. There's no, uh, there's no, uh, you know, we're not pushing anybody, you know, it's whatever you want to do, whatever you find fun, whatever you like to, to do in your free time is totally awesome. So uh, definitely two very distinct programs, um, but we're obviously much cooler. Uh, I'm just going to throw that out there that uh, I'm a little bit biased uh, being a champion, of course, and not an MVP, but uh, a great question nonetheless. Um, moving back to data integration, um, there's a question on um, regions. So um, with data flows in Synapse pipelines, um, the uh, integration uh, runtime um, with the region set to auto resolve, um, does it not uh, support a region specific selection? <clears throat> yeah, that that gets back to the uh, what we were discussing earlier with where right. within the the Synapse workspaces is more tied to a region um, 
uh, holistically. In, a in ADF, the region that you build your factory is really just where we store the metadata, and then your integration runtimes can be located anywhere. And um, uh, that approach is a little different than the Synapse approach, where Synapse also has a database and a Spark cluster and uh, this, that, and the other thing. And so because of that, the, the uh, data is located in the region that you've chosen for the workspace. And that, that's for things like, you know, um, uh, the uh, uh, GDPR kind of things and other reasons why you would have your data located uh, within that one region, not have to uh, leave that region, regress that region. So for that reason, uh, we just use the auto resolve. Uh, that way it just goes to that region. Um, it is a common ask to be able to support cross region. That is something that we're looking at doing. I don't have um, any uh, commitments on that at this time, but it's something that if it becomes, if it's still something that is really needed, I'd love to capture use cases on that uh, so that we can prioritize that work for appropriately. Fair enough. Um, so moving on to the next question. So when we're talking about uh, data ingestion, um, obviously there's a lot of options that can be very confusing. There's all these file formats, there's partitioning, there's all these things to think about. So focusing specifically on file formats, how do you pick the right file format for your data? <laughs> wow. Um, great <laughs> for, for a very uh, easy question for you. Let's spend the next three hours on this one, Ryan. Um, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's a tricky question. So um, I'll give you sort of some general guidance on it, uh, specific to the data lake in Synapse, so that we can kind of at least put some guardrails around it. Um, if you're building a data analytics products or solution where you want to be able to read the data as a data warehouse or for analytics, um, we suggest and recommend Parquet as the format for that. So I'm just going to be just point blank and say that. Um, uh, the reason for that is because it works really, really well with compression and with the ability then to read that when you're performing aggregate queries against it. Um, and we have a whole set of transformations and optimizations within data flows and synapse that understand Parquet uh, really, really well. In addition to that, if you want to move over to Delta Lake to be able to get that CRUD operation on that, that's fully supported and is also based on Parquet. So we definitely recommend um, Parquet for that. Uh, that being said, Parquet can be a little tricky to work with because if you haven't worked with it before, you know, it's not, it is a, a uh, compressed and binary format that you can't just easily read. You need a reader for it, uh, although we do have that. In Synapse, um, CSVs, if you pass CSVs around, they're much easier to read, but CSVs lose, um, there's lossiness in CSVs because there's not data type stored with that. Parquet stores data type and headers for each of the columns, which makes it very, very effective when you are uh, using that data later downstream, which is why we recommend Parquet. Parquet also compresses um, really, really well. Um, you'll see very commonly um, within the lake, both JSON and Avro as well, uh, uh, JSON is a little messy to work with when you are using uh, ETL tools. Uh, we fully support hierarchical based transformations within Synapse and Dataflows, which is a very, very exciting feature. Uh, it's a little complicated because you need to be able to get to um, you know, end levels of hierarchies in there, and you also have to unroll arrays. We have transformations that do this, um, but you have to understand how that, <clears throat> how that works. So once you've done it a few times, I think you usually get the hang of it. JSON just gets a little bit complicated in that regard. And if you if you stick with Parquet, you can still have hierarchical data inside of your Parquet. So that's why I still recommend Parquet in that case. Avro is very common in the lake just because a lot of uh, big data and streaming technologies write to Avro naturally, like VentHub, uh, for example. So you can see Avro very commonly, which also has a hierarchical hierarchical uh, format supported in it. Um, so let me, I, don't, I know we have a lot of questions to, to cover. I just want to quick show, <laughs> I want to show one thing real quick um, to just to kind of drive home what I'm talking about. Um, when you are working with data, it's very uh, common to work with relational data. And you've probably done this many times if you're in a data engineer or you've worked with other tools like SSIS or Data Factory in the past. But if you are going to work with data that is, um, that is Avro um, or that is Parquet or that is JSON, you can inside of there natively um of course i don't have a projection on this so i'm going to actually go over to this one um over here and let me just show you what this looks like so if you have a projection of data that has things like maps in it for example you can natively work with those 
Um, you can parse those. You can flatten all that. There's a whole set of transformations within um, Synapse, in which this is the data flows piece of Synapse and Data Factory, that will allow you to work um, natively with that. So you can access um, all that data deep within those hierarchies. Um, so if I use something like a derived column, which should seem very familiar with you if you've used SSIS in the past, and I go to that input schema that has the, um, uh, the different data types in it, I'll be able to um, look, I'm, I'm going to go all the way back up here to the, close to the source and do this. You'll be able to see the uh, map types in here. So I can access the different parts of the properties of system properties um, directly within um, the uh, transformation. Now, Avro is um, definitely something you're going to see very often. I would not necessarily recommend that as the format that you land the data in. Um, Parquet is going to work much better in Spark. Remember, data flows are all based on Synapse Spark, so I'd recommend that, but Avro is also very common. Okay, I just realized I gave you a lot of options. Um, I would go back to just kind of my prioritization list is for big data analytics. I definitely recommend Parquet. I think for writing a lot into the lake, I would probably look at Delta Lake for that. Um, CSV is going to be probably the least effective. It has lossiness. It doesn't uh, contain data types. We do auto detect data types in Synapse for those, but that can change from time to time based on the contents of, the, of those columns. This is a very big discussion that we could go on know, and on. And on. But but, but, uh, but I'd like to I'd like to add something here, Ryan, yeah. that uh, for the for the Synapse uh, copy activity, right? Because the copy has been there for a long time, right? Four to five years now. So the way if you look at the copy source format, I put a link. See, uh, we basically detect you know all kinds of source data automatically. You know, you don't have to do anything out of the box. You know. We can copy your files and you know and then source right you can see if there's a header or not right if it's compressor or not right so pretty much uh, default you know um, at least from the from the copy side okay yeah so uh you're talking so to, to dive in a little bit deeper um mm -hmm. for a second mm -hmm. um you're talking about uh, that csv is lossy so um would you take into consideration data quality um mm -hmm. when you're considering your data types so for instance let's say you're you know you're starting at a very simple level maybe you have um you're using csv is just you know to keep things simple and then you're migrating trying to up level your analytics get a little bit deeper um into your system maybe you're starting to pull in more data um do those considerations come into play so it, 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 for that, you will use you know Synapse data flow for uh, you know for most uh, for any data quality you know tasks, right? And we have so got, just just type in your search box at the top left. Type in the word assert in there as you're talking, just so that we can kind of show that. No, not, not there. The filter by title under the co table of contents. Okay. Right, right there. Just type in assert. So this is what you're going to use to set yeah, expectations. Uh, it's the second link. Um, second link. Yeah. So this is what you're going to do to set those expectations, and this will allow you to set data quality rules uh, when you are working with data. And, and yeah, I think that's fair to say what Ryan is is asserting, which is that um, um, CSV files can be dirtier than other uh, types. That's for sure. That being said, Avro, because it's very common in Event Hub and other streaming types of data, is also going to be very uh, uncleansed because that's going to have a lot of raw data. Um, in it um, as well. Sometimes, to be honest with you, th that's a it's kind of either or. Sometimes CSVs can be cleaner because sometimes CSVs are exports of a database table. Um, but uh, so it's not really clear cut in that regard. I would just say I would recommend that you set your expectation rules here in uh, the assert transformation in Synapse to do that. There's a this I have a short video there on that page, um, and then there are some examples in there as well. Um, They'll walk you through how to do that. You can just uh, look at that on your own time. Yeah, so there are some expressions here. You can fail. There's no, yeah. Data awesome. quality is a huge, a huge area of yeah. um, is data quality, yeah. 
yeah so so again right so so if you want to do like uh, you know uh, data curating data prep and data flow but uh, if you come the copy right we just do a you know, full file copy we do a checksum right that's all right nothing much but anything else so you have add a column check data validity you know data quality or uh, some statistics and all that you have to use you know uh, data flow for that all right, and I think we are running just about into the end of our session. Uh, one quick uh, final question to answer, though, and the question was, where do you find more resources and uh, information? And the answer to that is a bunch of places. You can find it on the uh, Synapse YouTube channel, of course, the ADF YouTube channel, Microsoft Docs, Microsoft Learn, MS Q&A, is also a very great place to find information. And of course, the Synapse Influencers hashtag, a very excellent way to find information. So I wanna thank everybody for joining us today. I wanna to thank Mark and Sunil for being our experts of the day. Thanks for joining. We'll hope to see you next time. Bye everybody. Thanks everybody, thanks Ryan.